Yes, um, I mean, thank you again, JJ and the Texas Beekeeper Association. It's my second time presenting at TB, TBA. Actually, we were going to present on uh, previous, uh, the summer clinic and other programs as well, but because of the COVID, so we need to postpone, but I'm so excited today. I mean, my heartbeat was keep changing since the morning. I mean, I know how I'm gonna do this. I did a lot of presentations to my students on the Zoom. I did other presentations, but somehow because of this, it's kind of, and maybe I'm in between your lunch. Uh, so that's kind of make me nervous as well. Anyway, so today I will be talking about honey in wood healing. So uh, most of the speakers here, I mean, thanks to them and then thanks to beekeepers associations that we all focus on how to make better honey uh, by having better queens and by having better worker bees, by having better hives, but we all focus on the production itself. But what about the produce itself? How can we use the produce other than just as a sweetener or just as sweet, um, you know, stuff? So actually honey is not a food for a long while. It was a very a royal thing for, I mean, a royal um, supplement or royal food um, for the for the Egyptians and for others. So I will go through them a little bit later. So again, I'd like to thank UTSA, the College of Sciences, uh, for having me to volunteer for research. And this is my uh, contact information. I will also show it at the end. So let's start from here. First of all, I'd like to disclaim that the content of this presentation is not intended to be substitute for um, sorry, for professional medical advice, diagnosis or treatment, please always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. I am a PhD, I'm not an MD, so I do research, I do not do the treatment. So that's why I really would like to share this disclaimer before I start. So, I mean, I don't know how long you know the honey, but honey has been used one of the first biological weapon in the history. So how do we know that? I mean, there are different historical <clears throat> records for this, but the, this one is pretty famous. In 67 BC, the Egyptian and the Romans and Persians, sorry, Romans and Persians were always fighting each other, I mean, to have the dominance in the land of Anatolia or today's uh, land of Turkey. So uh, in this state, 67 BC, Romans were running after the Persians. And this fight was between the poison king, which is the Mithridates the, of the Persian. So, I mean, I would recommend you to do, read this book because this guy, the, I mean, the, the king Mithridates, he was using the poisons in a certain small amount that he gained resistance to all of the poisons. And when he decided to su commit suicide, when he was captivated or almost being captivated by the Romans, he used the poisons, but none of the poisons worked on him because he got resistance by taking them small. And he knew how to use the poisons against his enemies as well. But this time, the poison was something sweet. So, and Pompey the Great, one of the greatest emperors of the Romans as well. So these two, they have uh, the fight over Anatolia. Again, this is today's, uh, uh, the country of Turkey. So, so in between Europe and Asia, or Eurasia, I would say. So this Anatolia has been land of uh, 13 different civilizations throughout the history. So thousands of years of history. But then I'm not gonna go all these figures in here. You can just uh, dig it later, but Turkey is one of the best places to visit in the world uh, in terms of, um, be, I mean, the land and the history. So on this Northeast part of the Turkey, which uh, where this uh, battle was happened between the Romans and Persians, there is a special uh, flower that is being grown. By the way, this flower is also this flower is also found in different parts of the United States and Europe as well. But this Rhododendron ponticum, so this is the special flower that grows endemic to that area. So what is the significance of this Rhododendron? You make this psychedelic honey or the mad honey. So the, the, the bees in that area, they visit this flower, the Rhododendron ponticum, and it has a very special toxin in it, which is called graniotoxin. And this graniotoxin, when it is consumed by the people, and if you are not familiar with it at all, if you are not having any resistance to it, it will make it psychedelic. So you will start seeing like different visions, <laughs> as you see from the bee on the top right here. So this is what the Mithridates, the Persian commander have used. So he put, the pots filled with mad honey on the road where the Roman soldiers will be passing. And you know what the Roman soldiers did? They loved the honey. They said, well, these villagers are so kind, so they put honey for us, we should dive in. And then they ate the honey with a good amount. And what's the result? 
look at them. I mean, these guys just got drunk or kind of, you know, um, they were under influence. So, so they cannot fight under influence in a battle. So what happened to them was as they consumed the medhani, they got the irregular heartbeat, they got bradycardia, which is a low heart rate, low blood pressure, mental confusion, impaired consciousness, blurred or double vision, dizziness, excessive perspiration, salivation, convulsions, nausea and vomiting and diarrhea. Look how easy to beat these soldiers when they consume this med honey. So they are easy to be beaten. And yes, this uh, King Persian, uh, Persian King Mithradates, they were able to beat them very easily in 67 BC. So by this way, med honey or honey itself has been one of the first biological weapons used in a battle. Okay, so what is this honey? Yeah, let's go through the, um, let, let's just go over its present, I mean, its uh, definition. Uh, according to the, some dictionaries, it's a sweet compound that has been produced by the honeybees. Sometimes it's mentioned as byproduct. So the nectar has been processed by the honeybees or sometimes the honeydew. And then they, pro they process them in their abdomens, mixed with the diastase enzyme and the other enzymes they keep, you know, regargrating between each other. About 200 honeybees regargrate to each other to have one, uh, less than one, I mean, one twelfth of a teaspoon uh, of honey. And then, but the most important part is honey is not a food all the time. It is both as a food and a therapeutic product. That's why it calls like nutritics. Uh, honey also is being used for this purpose. So it has a nutritional value and it has biological activity or bioactivity potential. And it has been used for so many civilizations. I'll go through them in a little bit. I'll skip this video for the time saving. Okay, uh, because this video was showing how the honey is being made in the beehives and it's uh, available on YouTube. Uh, I'll be happy to share it later. And by the way, my presentation is available um, uh, online. So it's on Prezi. If you write Prezi and my name, Ferhat Osturk, and if you write medicinal honey, most probably you will get it pretty easily, but I'll be happy to share it uh, if you email to me as well. But about this history of medical honey. So uh, as we have seen in, the, in this morning's presentation, I mean, human beings have been harvesting or hunting honey since the beginning of the years. So this, the man of Bicorp in Valencia, Spain, it has been discovered uh, that it's almost 15,000 years old. So the uh, honey hunters were going into the cliffs of the mountains and to get the honey from the bee beehives or like wild bees. And then they were, uh, you know, indulging them. But at the same time, honey has been used for medical purposes, especially after the wounds. And also the most of the, one of the oldest civilizations, Sumerian, Babylon, and Hittites. And by the way, all three, all these three uh, civilizations were in the Middle East and Anatolia. So they have, un they have used honey uh, and they lived between uh, 4,000 to 6,000 years ago. And they were very respectful to the queen bee or the bees. And they used honey for so many of their rituals and in their royal life. And then also in the Indian and Chinese culture, I mean, all over the world have used honey. So in the Rig Veda, in the Ayurveda of the Indian culture, they have a very nice uh, poem I would like to share with you. So let every wind that blows drop honey. Let the rivers and streams recreate honey. Let all our medicines turn into honey. Let the dawn and the evening will be full of honey. Let the darkness be converted to honey. Let our nourisher, the sky above, be full of honey. Let our trees be honey. Let the sun be honey. Let our cows make honey. I mean, the bees make honey, though. But this is a wonderful poem. I really like it. It's so honey is all over the world. And also in the Chinese medicine, according to Fundamentals of Chinese Medicine by Zhong Yi, Hu, and uh, Ji Chu, so that, um, I mean, honey is a balanced, sweet, non-toxic uh, food that enters to the lung, spleen, and the large intestine meridian channels. And, um, and it has been shown that it relieves the pain, it relieves the stomach pain, the deeps, it, it is a deep source for the nasal congestion. It helps feel, healing the mouth sores, skulls, and burns. So it's all over the place. And what about the Greeks and Romans, the ancestors of the European uh, culture? So yes, Greeks and Romans have also widely used the bee in their role culture. And as you can see from here, there's a coin of Ephesus with a bee on it, and also another necklace uh, with the two queen bees uh, you know, touching each other. 
So it didn't finish yet in the Egyptians. I mean, Egyptians are the civilizations that has used the honey in the most elevated level. It has been used the the tombs of the pharaohs, and it has been used as like as a service to the gods, the Egyptian gods. So and their honeybee hieroglyphs dating back to three thirty one hundred BC, and honeybee has or the honey and the bee itself. I mean, has been widely. Uh, it was a sacred thing in the Egyptian uh, civilizations. And what about the Turks, Arabs, and Persians? They as well, I mean, they have used the honeybee for a quite while. So, and then uh, this, uh, the person, the scholar on this photo is, I mean, on this picture is Avicenna or Ibn Sina. And he has been known as the father king of medicine. So uh, he has been in a, in a, picture on a depiction that he has been shown together with the Hippocrates, Avicenna and Galen together on the same picture. So Galen is the father of pharmacy, uh, Hippocrates is the father of medicine and Avicenna is the king of medicine. So he has written the different articles in like so many different fields. That's why he has been named as Hazar Fen, like 1000 sciences. So he has a, a he has a crater in moon that he, disc I mean, uh, this his name was given. He has written books about musicology, like the music theories. He has written books about pharmacology. And he has the five volume books of the canon of medicine. And his book, the canon of medicine, has been used in Europe for 500 years as the major text for medical students. So for 500 years, and it was from the beginning of the Renaissance. So he has been the first footsteps I mean, of the Renaissance has been done by Avi Senna. So we can, I can spell that A-V-I-C-E-N-N-A. So Avicenna is the, uh, the king of the medicine, has been known in this way. And then he has been used, honey, in most of his pharmacological, uh, you know, texts. So there are more than 40, there are more than 40 uh, recipes in his books that use honey for healing. What about the religious scriptures? I mean, since honey has been, like, um, uh, revered by so many civilizations. Also, there is a religion on the background of it. So, honey has been mentioned both in Bible, the Torah, and the Quran. So, in the Torah, the land of Israel has been described, or the literally means flowing with milk and honey. So, Israel means, I mean, today literally Israel means milk and honey, the flowing one. And also, in the verse in grace after meals, the Israels, the seven species of fruit and grain, honey is there. And also, it's very interesting that when the Israelites were in the wandering in the desert, uh, God has provided them honey wafers for 40 years, and then they were eaten at Rosh Hashanah. And that's why we have apple and honey on the Rosh Hashanah celebration uh, among the Jews. And then in the Bible, the wise King Solomon, and I have seen this on one of the uh, honey labels uh, on the market. I'm so impressed with that. I really liked it because it's a verse from the Bible. It says, eat the honey because it is good. And also interestingly, the day uh, Jesus Christ rose from the dead and appeared before his disciples, he asked for food. And his disciples gave him broiled fish and a honeycomb. So Chris ate the food and then to prove that, uh, that he is a truly resurrected and he's not merely a spirit or a thought, he's a truly human. And then in the Quran, the holy book of the Muslims, so in the Quran, there is a chapter separate, I mean, there is a, a chapter separated or like uh, just for the B. And then at this in this B chapter, there are some verses, there are two, three verses that really uh, made me to go into this field after having my PhD in cell and molecular biology and then had the bioinformatics studies. After all of these, I mean, I came across with this verse and it really changed my track to go into the integrative medicine. Anyway, so God says in the Quran, Thai Lord has inspired the bees to build their hives in hills, on trees, and in men's habitations. And the, here's information here. From within their bodies comes a drink of varying colors, which is honey, wherein healing for mankind. So it is clearly mentioned there's a healing for mankind. And verily, in this is a sign for those who give thought. So after all these uh, uh, religious and cultural backgrounds, so I would like to go what is in the honey? I mean, what makes honey to be used for medicine? So first of all, honey is a very complex mixture. There are more than 200 compounds in this. 
and majority of them is the sugar. About 80%, I mean 76% of honey is just sugars, like fructose, glucose, sucrose, maltose, and uh, turanose and other sugars. So, and then this is changing from location to location based on the nectar source. So th these compounds are changing, but the most important one are the flavonoids and phenolic acids, which are serving as antioxidants and antimicrobials. So again, the composition of honey differs depending on the strain of the honeybee, the geographical location, the fauna, and the climate and nectar source of the honey. So this can change, even the uh, um, moisture and pH can change with all these. So honey is not, um, I would say, not all honey is created equal. So <laughs> they're all changing. Okay, what about honey as a medicine? So I already mentioned that honey has a, a, a very revered position in the different cultures. So let's see what does honey offer to us. So honey is like so many biological activities. So it's that, like we can uh, uh, name a few, the most important one is the wound healing. So this is the one that has been used throughout the history and now mostly for wound healing. And honey is also anti-inflammatory. So it uh, suppresses inflammation. It's a gastroprotective. So honey has prebiotics that is helping our microbiome. And then honey is anti-cancer, so it is preventing the occurrence of the cancer because it's an antioxidant. Honey is, anti honey is antibacterial because it doesn't allow the bad bacteria to grow on the open wounds or on the other areas of the body. Honey, honey is interesting and surprising. It's anti-diabetic because honey has a low glycemic index, which is very helpful for the diabetics. But again, this is not their medical advice, but, but diabetics can use uh, the honey once they exchange the honey with another carbohydrate. So they need to separate the carbohydrate and add honey there, and it will be helping to them. And again, honey is antioxidant, I mentioned already, and honey is cardioprotective. So it has been shown that honey has, again, the people who consume honey uh, regularly, they have a little bit less chance of cardiovascular diseases. Okay, and uh, if I would like to just uh, summarize, I mean, what has been used in, in the, in the uh, history. So this paper is very, very helpful. I would highly recommend you if you like reading scientific papers, this uh, Miguel uh, Antunes and Falero in 2017, they made this wonderful review about honey as a complementary medicine. So in this review, they mentioned that uh, honey has been used both historically in the modern life, but as I mentioned earlier, it's been by Roman, Egyptian, Assyrians, Chinese, Greeks, they have used honey, and it was mostly used for wound salve as a, a treatment of gut diseases. I mean, interestingly, honey has been used to treat both diarrhea and constipation. Hold on, how come? How come something can both treat diarrhea and constipation? They're opposite to each other, that's true. But it, the, the key, the secret is in how you dissolve the honey. So if you dissolve the honey in warm water, you will be helping your constipation. If you help dissolve your honey in cold water, you will help your diarrhea. It's because the, once the honey is dissolved in cold water, the level of some of the enzymes activated and some of the pro, uh, products that it's produced, they will help the bowels to hold more water and then diarrhea will be prevented or alleviated. If you drink warm honey, so it will help your constipation to get relieved because it will allow, it will increase the number of microbiomes, I mean, the good microbes in the intestines and then the constipation will be relieved after that. Again, honey has been used for eye infections, for the control of acute fever, pain relief in the history. And in the modern life, again, honey has been the star, uh, I mean, the full star uh, healing agent for the, in the infection of the wounds and both surgical wounds, ulcerated wounds, and burn wounds. And again, another very, very important property of honey is honey can kill the multi-drug resistant bacteria. So normally this is a very major issue. I'll come to it a little bit later, but honey can kill drug resist, antibiotic resistant bacteria as well. And it also prevents the biofilm formation. And also honey has been used for wound debridement, conjunctivitis, treatment of cancer, alleviation of the chemotherapy treatment, so, and so many different uses. I mean, honey is out in the hospitals, out in the medical field, almost like three de decades. And the father of this is, I mean, I really would like to appreciate the works of Professor Peter Mullen, who passed away in 2016. He was from New Zealand, and he's the father of Manuka honey as well. But he uh, has done a lot of research to put the honey back into the uh, clinic. 
Okay, and as I mentioned, I mean, honey has been used in today's world. And look at this. This is the Cochrane collaboration. And this is a very uh, highly referenced uh, uh, journal among the medical clinical field. And 2016, there was a review of honey as a topical treatment for wounds. So in this review, they have analyzed more than 200 clinical trials going on worldwide or completed in worldwide. So which means that honey has been used in the clinic for a long, I mean, for quite a while. And a lot of, the, I mean, it, in the past, most of the nurses or family doctors were using, but nowadays I'm hearing even dermatologists and uh, plastic surgeons and like, people, like doctors from different specialties, they started to use honey for their uh, treatment of their patients. And on the other hand, honey has been used to treat acute, acute cough in children. I have a daughter, she's three and a half years old. And whenever she starts uh, like coughing, I always just bump the honey into her mouth and it's mostly the buckwheat honey. And or, or whenever she like starts uh, feeling not very good. So, and she loves it. So she loves the honey. I'm, I'm feeding uh, her with honey for like since uh, her infantry. So our infancy. And again, there was a paper, a review on 2018 that uh, honey has been, uh, the use of honey for acute cough in children has been analyzed and so many clinical trials were um, analyzing this study and feel free, you, can, you feel free to visit these uh, papers too. Okay, uh, where does the biological activity of, of honey comes from? Sorry, I need to drink some water. I'm getting thirsty, dehydrated. Okay. So where does the biological activity come from? I mean, first of all, honey has high sugar concentration, 76%. I mean, any bacteria that you put in 76% sugar, they will not survive. That's one of the things that it does do. So that's why some, uh, some scientists or some doctors, they say instead of honey, we can just use like high density sugar to prevent the bacterial formation. That is true and it will prevent the bacteria to get there. But once it is there, it will not prevent their multiplication or reproduction. So honey is not only a high sugar concentration food. It also has acidity. So the, the pH of honey can go as low as 2.5 and it can go up to 5.6. So, I mean, it has a very good acidity and this is not very welcoming for the bacteria to grow in acidic environments. And then another important property is the hydrogen peroxide. So once you dissolve the honey in water, as, I mean, normally when the honey is produced, there we have glucose in it and we have gluconic uh, acid. In the, uh, in the environment. And the nice thing is that the bees, they put a very crucial enzyme, which is called glucose oxidase. So this glucose oxidase will bind to the glucose when uh, dissolved in water and it will produce the gluconic acid and water. Uh, water. So, I mean, uh, and hydrogen peroxide, sorry. So the hydrogen peroxide will be produced once the honey is dissolved in, uh, in water. And then this amount of hydrogen peroxide, normally it has been used as a bleaching agent. I mean, for so many decades by the doctors to clean the wound, you know, we still have hydrogen peroxide. If you go to a grocery, I mean, a pharma pharmacy store, you can buy 3% uh, hydrogen peroxide pretty easily. But the problem with that one is hydrogen peroxide not only kills the bacteria, but it also kills some of the live human cells. So that's why we really need to use very little amount. But the nice thing about honey, so once the honey is dissolved in water, the amount of hydrogen peroxide is less than 0.3%, and it is continuous, it is sustainable. So which means that there is a small amount and, and enough amount of hydrogen peroxide to kill the bacteria, but at the same time, it is a continuous thing, so it will not allow them to reproduce. So that's why the hydrogen peroxide in honey, once it's dissolved in water, is very crucial for the biological activity potential of the honey. And in addition to this one, remember we said not all honey are created equal, so which means that honey from different nectar sources, they will have different organic antibacterial compounds. So think about this. I mean, honey, the honeybee is working like a pharmacist. So it goes from flower to flower and it collects those small nectar. But at the same time, in that nectar, there are also some chemicals, some organic antibacterial compounds in them. So these compounds, which are called phenolic acids and flavonoids, so these are coming from different flower sources. And these are very, very helpful. I mean, uh, for, to prevent the diseases or to prevent the uh, reproduction of the bacteria and fungi and also some viruses. Okay, um, antibacterial compounds, uh, antimicrobial compounds within honey. And I got this figure from, uh, it's a recent research in 2019, December. So this is a Nolan uh, about the dissecting the antimicrobial composition of honey. 
And uh, it is, there are four major things in honey, and this is mostly about the Monica honey actually, but uh, the phenolics that are coming from the nectar source, from the flower itself, or sometimes the honeydew. And also the hydrogen peroxide, which I mentioned briefly, that uh, I mean, it has been produced when the, uh, the enzyme, I mean, when the honey is dissolved in water, we got the glucose oxidase enzyme and it will produce hydrogen peroxide, which will fight with the bacteria. And another important uh, protein, I mean, or antibiotic, which is the B defense in one, and this is coming from the bee, honeybee itself. And this protein is a very strong antimicrobial agent. And finally, the methyl glyoxal, which is coming from the T3 or leptospermum spermicum, uh, leptospermum, uh, the T trees, that it is only available in this. Uh, I mean, the uh, I forgot the name of the product, but the methyl glyoxal produced as a reaction with the water. And then this methyl glyoxide will also prevent the bacterial formation. And once you see like different levels of Monica and different, um, um, like different classification of Monica honey, you, you see like 10 plus, 15 plus, 25 plus. So all these because of the amount of the methyl glyoxal within the Monica honey. Yes, it is specific for Monica, but it is not, not Monica is not the only uh, antimicrobial honey. So there are so many different other antimicrobial honeys too. And uh, how does it do? I'm not going to spend too much time on this because of the, the time constraint, but uh, honey, I mean, the, uh, the, the antimicrobial components of honey, I mean, the polyphenols can inhibit the DNA production or the high sugar content, they increase the water potential. So the bacteria will just release the water out and they will shrink. And also the high osmotic pressure, the bacteria cannot grow in high osmotic pressure. And the, again, um, the defense molecule, I mean, it innates, uh, disrupts the membrane permeability of the bacteria. So the bacteria releases the membrane and then the water can get in and then the bacteria will die. And uh, methyl glyoxal, this is the one from Monica, it structures the fimbria and flagella. So this is also important for bacteria cannot attach to the, uh, to the host cell. So again, there's uh, other uh, important, uh, you know, antimicrobial activity of honey, but again, this is a, once this itself is a very long presentation, so I'll just uh, go with this much here. And which bacteria can honey kill? I mean, according to our research that, uh, our, I mean, collaborative research with a professor in Malaysia, that um, honey can kill, I mean, these are the bacteria that has been scraped off from the wounds of the patients. So these are bacteria that are living on the wounds, on open wounds, like the ulcerative burn wounds. And then uh, these bacteria has been cu cultured. And the interesting part is look at number one and number seven. I know we know, we know that honey can kill all different, different species, gram positive and gram negative bacteria from different backgrounds, but honey can also kill the resistant bacteria. And again, these are just two of them, medicinal resistant Staph aureus and medicinal resistant Staph epidermidis. Again, these are the uh, bacteria that causes uh, infection on the wounds. But these are hospital diseases. And unfortunately, by 2050, it is expected that the hospital diseases or and the, these superbugs or these resistant bacteria, by 2050, they will be the number one killer in the world. It will, be, it will kill more people than heart disease and the cancer itself. So that's why there is a strong and an immediate need to have either more antibiotics or more honey, which can kill these resistant bacteria as well. Okay, so right now I will go to one of our clinical studies for wound healing, and this is a collaborative study with, uh, with our uh, partners in University of Malaysia and in Kuala Lumpur. And uh, the professor that has established uh, the Honey Research Center in Turkey, that I was the director of Honey Research Center before I moved to United States in 2016. So this study was done by him and we collaborated you know, for the analysis. So uh, before I will go through this one about wound healing, so I will just give brief information about how the wound healing happens. So normally, I mean, when you have a wound on your body, the first thing that happens is the blood will clot on there. So it will prevent the leakage of the blood. And then the fibroblast macrophages, they will just attack to the skin. I mean, they'll just go into the skin and they will start fighting any bacteria there. And then they will start healing the wound. And eventually these fibroblasts will proliferate and then they will be making new cells here. And then there's a subcutaneous state will be increased. And finally, after the wound is healed, we will have fresh hit epidermis and the dermis. So these four phases are bleeding, inflammatory, proliferative and remodeling. And you know what? I mean, honey has been used for wound healing for centuries. So, and how does the honey does this? So honey is active in all these stages. 
So honey can help with the inflammatory phase by uh, preventing wound bioburden, wound bioburden, oxidative cellular damage by a wound formation, and it prevents bacterial cell cycle and progression and decrease the wound pH. So all these things are to prevent the bacteria to attach and grow on the wound. And on the other hand, honey is increasing peroxide, like hydrogen peroxide, and it, it, it increases the number of pro-inflammatory cytokines, which is for the macrophages to come in, and also increase antioxidant activity. On the second phase, which is the proliferative phase, when the wound starts to heal, when the cells you know, reproduce. So honey increases epithelization, and honey increases the granulation of the tissue, and also it decreases the wound edema and exudate, so, which is very helpful to, you know, uh, to debride the, the wound itself. And also finally in the remodeling phase, and it's also very important that most of the patients, most of the wounds treated with honey, they do not end up with a scar. So honey and makes a perfect work. So, I mean, 99% of the time, honey does not leave any scar behind when, on the wounds. And then in the remodeling phase, wound, remo wound remodeling and, uh, is done, scar formation and contractures are significantly decreased by the application of the honey. And this is another picture for the Manuka. I mean, that how they showed, I really like this picture, I wanted to share, but uh, so, so honey is, you know, sucking the exudates, lymph fluid and debris to the outer of the skin, I mean, upper levels of the skin, which is epidermis. And then it's also preventing, I mean, it's also giving osmotic action. And then also it's like uh, uh, the, the honey goes deeper into the wound and so that it can help, you know, for, uh, you know, for the macrophages and fibroblast cells there too. Okay, so the, in this study, the honey dressing were performed in 102 patients. And then uh, these patients have either wounds and ulcers that have failed to heal with conventional treatment. So these patients, they have used antibiotics, they have used anti-inflammatory drugs, but none of them worked. So this is a last resort treatment for these patients. Unfortunately, I mean, for these clinical trials, it's not very easy to convince the hospital or the, uh, the you know, the, uh, the I mean, the, the, the health system to try them directly on the honey treatment. So they, they said, okay, if these patients cannot be treated by anything else, it's yours, try honey on them. So it's kind of this way. So, uh, and then these, I mean, these ones, again, they, they fail to heal with all other treatments. And I would like to give you a warning. There are some graphic contents in here. Maybe you have seen some of them uh, before I moved into here. So if you don't like, if you, the kids don't, if you have uh, kids watching this, or other people who doesn't like the wounds, I mean, don't feel comfortable. So you may just uh, turn off your monitor or just listen to it. Anyway, okay, so this is how the uh, honey is applied to the wound. So from number one to number 10, so these are steps. First of all, clean the wound. And as you can see, this wound is pretty big. I mean, the hand can fit into here. So the nurse is cleaning the wound with 10%. It's important, it is 10% honey solution. It is not the honey itself. It is not the iodine or something else. 10% honey solution. And in these studies, the honey used is not Manuka. The honey was used from the Gelam honey or Tualang honey from, the Mal from Malaysia. So it is the local honey that has been shown a high bioactivity uh, in, uh, in Kuala Lumpur area. And they use this for the treatment of these patients. And this honey is gamma irradiated, which means that normally, I mean, you, you should not be applying anything under the patients unless it is sterilized. And honey cannot be sterilized by heat or by gas, so it needs to be sterilized by gamma irradiation to kill any spores that are left in honey. Normally, no bacteria, no virus, no fungi can live inside the honey, but spores, those spore-forming bacteria, they can survive on the, within the honey because they just live in a spore that protect themselves. Anyway, so these are gamma irradiated honey. It has been 10% uh, honey cleans the wound area. And then um, after that, I mean, the gauze is uh, thrown away so that and then the honey is poured into the uh, open wound. And because the wound is so big, it is poured. But if it is smaller, it's like a small cut or something, you can just pour the honey into the gauze pad and then apply it there or even the band-aid. So then, then the gauze pad is filled here. And then uh, the, the dressing has been finalized after that. And this has been done, depending on the patient, up to three times in a day, depending on the depth of the wound. And this patient, uh, as far as I remember, it was being treated three times, morning, noon, and in uh, evening. This patient has been treated with honey because it's sucking the honey very quickly. So this is, the pa this is one of the patients uh, in, the, in the clinical trial that it's a hemiparotic bed sore. So you can see the leg of the patient. And here, this is the first photo, like beginning of the treatment after all other treatments failed. 
And then in the second week, you can see the fresh tissue, the, the red you know, tissue is coming out of it. So all the dead bacteria is dead. I mean, it's loft off and the bad smell is gone. The green, the, so the yellow pus is over. So it is all fresh tissue. So which means that this is ready for healing. And then in the third week, the healing has started. In the fourth week, I mean, the wound has shrinked so, uh, I mean, so nicely. And you can see those stitches. This is from a previous, um, you know, stitching effort by the doctor. So to stop the growth of the, uh, you know, infected tissue, but you can see all the stitches here too. So, I mean, the wound was healed within seven weeks completely and the patient was discharged after that. So the, this has survived the amputation of the patient. And this is a very interesting patient. So this is a 26 year old male and uh, the patient has a chronic non-healing diabetic wound. And this patient has multiple um, amputations, which means that the patient, because of the diabetic, so the patient's wound has started on the feet and then on the right feet. And then uh, they could not stop the infection and they amputated the feet, they cut, out, cut it out. And then the infection started again where the amputation was done. Then they amputated from the knee. And then after that, the, again, uh, infection, and they amputated from the leg, from up leg. As you can see, this is the groinal area. And then, I mean, there's no way to cut anymore. This patient is done of amputations because this is the belly. I mean, it's abdomen. So there's no way to treat this patient and the antibiotics failed. And then uh, after the honey treatment, one week after that, again, as you can see, the pus is gone, the bacteria, the dead bacteria sloughed off, the dead tissue is gone, and then this wound is ready to be healed. And on the third week, again, you can see that like more uh, fresh tissue, the, the muscle tissue is being more visible. And on the fourth week, because the uh, wound is so big, it cannot be healed by itself. There's not enough you know, skin to cover it. So they made a skin graft from the other leg and they just covered. So this patient was survived. I mean, after three amputations, the patient was survived. And uh, this, uh, I mean, this other things has applied to him, like the, um, you know, the, the proteins leg. Another one is a sword slice. So this is out of a street fight. <laughs> so one of the guys uh, involved in street fight, he's a 40 year old male and he has a traumatic laceration of, on the lateral aspect of upper arm. So first week, I mean, the, the, the wound has infection, looks pretty bad, most probably it will be amputated. But again, after one week of honey treatment, you can see the tissue has cleaned, the fresh tissue came up and then no more debris, I mean, no more dead cells. Third week, the wound has like shrink so much. And the fourth week, we don't have fourth week. You know what happened? The patient ran away from the hospital, <laughs> back to the streets. Okay, and these are some other examples. Again, uh, because of the time constraint, I will not go uh, all of them one by one. But again, this is a diabetic neuropathic also within two weeks of healing. So this is the, the feet of, foot of the patient. And after a honey treatment, you can see the progress of healing. And after three weeks, you have a complete foot, I'm completely healed foot. And this is another patient with varicose ulcer on the leg. And then in six time of healing, again, when it is on the leg, it is harder to, you know, uh, treat. So, and uh, after six weeks of healing, we can see the, the wound is completely healed. And another example is chronic traumatic ulcer. Again, in three weeks, it has been healed. This, and this one is in two weeks, the wound was healed completely. And then it's not only used for human, but also for animals. I mean, this is one of my friends in Michigan. They, they have this honey cure uh, uh, bandages or honey. They use Manuka honey for their studies. I mean, for their, uh, you know, products. So this is, um, I mean, this is uh, the dog that has been uh, caught by a right front wheel of the truck. And then uh, unfortunately, I mean, this has no broken bones, but the, uh, it has inflamed and there's infection on the dog. Uh, on the bottom part, I mean, leg part of dog. And then after uh, twice a day, and it took a while, but as you can see, the dog was completely healed. I mean, the wound was completely healed. So uh, this is a very good example of veterinary use of the honey. And there are so many other veterinary uses like it has been used on the horses, on the cats, on farm animals. So honey, has been, honey is being used as a medicine for wound treatment for so many different areas. Okay, in summary of these clinical trials, so honey, it kills the bacteria at the site of the wounds. Honey debrides the cleanup of the wounds. I mean, honey sloughs off the dead cells rapidly. That's why how we see those uh, pus and everything is going down and the, the fresh tissue is coming. Honey enhances the granulation and reapitalization and honey absorbs the edema, the swelling there. 
It reduces further infection because it doesn't allow the bacteria to grow. And also it overcomes offensively smelly wounds because it kills the bacteria, which causes those sulfur gases, which makes the smell. And unfortunately, it's very uh, uncomfortable for so some people when it is smelling pretty bad. And it also reduces the need for skin graft treatment. So as a result, as a conclusion, honey is out there, I mean, for thousands of years. It's a very economical, easily accessible, and high efficient agent for wound healing. And honey has to be introduced as a frontline product. And luckily, it has been used by so many physicians and clinic clinicians that as a frontline, and especially by the nurses and female doctors. And then honey encloses perfect mix of synergistically active ingredients. So all these ingredients come together. And thus, it's op offering a promising chance for clinical employment to manage human wounds and as well as animal wounds and also some cancer types. And the last word is, as described earlier by Dr. Zumla, Honey is a remedy rediscovered. I'd like to thank, I mean, I'd like to especially thank to uh, UTSA uh, for uh, allowing me, I mean, approving me to work in the lab, Dr. Kelly Nash, and then Texas Beaker Association, especially JJ. I mean, I'm thankful to him that he kind of discovered me uh, that like to give these talks. And then uh, luckily, I mean, I will be more active in the research field. And I think you already mentioned, uh, so we are collecting samples to find which honey can be used, uh, which text in honey can be used for medical purpose. And it will be in my presentation this afternoon at 3 p.m., which honey to be used for these medical purposes. So not, remember, not every honey has created equal, so not every honey can be medical purpose. So we will talk about it in the afternoon at 3 p.m. And then I also would like to thank uh, Dr. Professor Kamil uh, Mohamed Yusuf from Malaysia. He was the founder of the Honey Research Center in Turkey. And uh, I'd like to thank Professor Yunus Bekdemir. He was the president of my university that I used, that I worked in Turkey. And um, I just would like to touch base one thing that because of the autocratic government in Turkey, um, uh, like about 8,000 academicians were jailed or, or lost their jobs. So my professor, uh, he's in jail for more than four years right now, despite his health uh, diseases. So, I mean, uh, please, I mean, if you pray, pray, please keep him in your prayers that he will be released as soon as possible. And then I'd like to thank for Alma College because I did my research in Michigan for the Michigan Honey uh, at the Alma College and that I currently work at the School of Science and Technology as biomedical science teacher. And again, thank you so much for joining today. And I believe I'm on time, 11.49. I think I used my time wisely. Sorry if I talk too fast. That's how I am. I'm trying to slow down myself, but it doesn't happen. <laughs> Okay, so again, uh, this is my email address. Um, you can use either drmedable at gmail.com or farhat.ostrick at utsa.edu. Okay, let me zoom in here. And if you want, you can take a photo of this image or you can just scan it from your cell phone. And now once you scan it from your cell phone, my contact information will be directly added to your phone. There's no virus in it. Don't worry about it. This is just my contact information. You can easily add to your phone book with my phone number, email address, and uh, you know my full name. Okay, I'll leave it here. If you want to get the contact information for another 30 seconds. Thank you, Dr. Osterk, that was wonderful. This is Charlie, I'm jumping in. We do have a few questions if you're willing to answer them real quickly. We had one, one gentleman, Justin Baxley, he says, Merhabalar, Dr. Osterk. Oh, we had a Turkish person. Turkey, <laughs> wonderful. He asked about uh, a local plant in Texas, monk's pepper or chase tree, vitex is a common decorative plant and the bees seem to like it. He asked, is there any risk that the, you can be producing pharmaceutical honey in, unintentionally? Okay, it's to a reactive flow and drug honey. Again, uh, I mean, to be honest, uh, I am new to, I'm not new, but it's two years that I'm in San Antonio right now. And uh, there are, again, I will be covering in the afternoon. <laughs> I don't want to keep saying that, but there are about like 90 different types of monofloral honeys. So, and there's no way to, you know, analyze all of them at once. And in Texas, uh, I'm collecting honey samples right now, and I'll be happy to look into that one, monk's pepper, the chest tree. So uh, again, please uh, feel free to send your samples either to TBA, I mean, Texas Big Association, or you can email to me, I can send me our, send my school address to you so you can also ship, ship it to me. And I'm collecting about like 50 to 60 samples and I will start analyzing them. I'm already in the lab, uh, established my procedure 
years. So I'm just collecting the samples now, and then uh, you will be contributing to the science. Uh, so I'll be happy to look into this. But uh, again, uh, I'm not a medical doctor, so I cannot directly tell how it affects the hormonal impacts on other things. Very good. There were a couple of questions, and, and we know you're not a physician, but about lung health and COVID-19, are there any uh, su specific recommendations for lung health, or has there been any eff efficacy proven around COVID-19? Sure. There I mean, that's a very good question. Um, uh, actually, I was reading about it, and I really would like to follow up because I was uh, I was going to work about antiviral properties of honey because honey has been shown to work on varicella zoster virus and, and um, herpes simplex viruses. So honey has been shown to work on some viruses to prevent, especially when someone has you know when you have the uh, what's it called the the bristles on your the uh, on your lips, so you can apply honey to there and it will suppress the viral growth there. So it has been shown that honey works on different viruses, but for the co coronavirus or COVID-19, we don't have enough evidence for it. But in a study in China, uh, again, this is not a full uh, clinical trial. It is an observational study that uh, the, the, the physicians there, so they have collected, uh, I mean, they asked the beekeepers if they, about their COVID-19 infection rate. And they found out the beekeepers or the people who are involved with bees who, who have been stung by honey. So that's why the bee sting is very critical here or bee venom. So those people who stung by honey they, or using the bee venom for the treatment, they were less infected by COVID-19. But again, this is an observational study. It's not a clinical trial. So bee venom can have a significant effect on, uh, on the COVID-19 um, or at least prevention of the COVID-19. And those beekeepers... Uh, again, this is what the article says. Uh, those beekeepers did not get COVID and the people around them, although the people around them got it. Very good. So, and the last question, someone asked about their dog is crazy about honey. Uh, is that, is there some uh, drive that the dog has other than just to taste good or the dog wants some healing properties? Is that um, I don't know. I mean, if the dog has a wound inside, because sometimes the body wants, to, you know, wants the healing thing. I mean, the, the agent sometimes, I don't know if the dog is craving for honey or so, uh, but again, uh, you should ask a veterinarian if consuming the honey by the dog, it will, you know, it may cause any issues in the future. I don't know about it because they cannot consume chocolate, right? So there's something with it. <laughs>